Good afternoon, everybody. Steve Olson here with the Fourplex Investment Group. Thanks for joining us. I see a bunch of you piling onto the line here, and uh, you're you're all going to actually mute automatically when you when you come onto the conference line. So that's why I can't hear you. But uh, I've done a sound check already with a couple of my coho cohorts that are on the call, and I, I think we're good to go here. John and Chase, just shoot me a a private message if you can't hear me. Uh, for some reason, but I, th I think we're all set to go. And it's it's one o'clock mountain time, the time that we said we'd start. And I always feel like if you're going to set a start time, why not start at that time? No better time than that one, right? So we're going to do it. Thanks again for joining us um, today on the webinar. I'm going to talk about a few things that we, uh, we've not, prob I don't think we've talked about on a webinar before. And we try to do these periodically, or we're starting to to try to do that to cover many of the questions that we hear regularly from, from our investors. And I know we've got a couple of our investors on the, uh, on the webinar now. Hi guys, I hope you're good. You know who you are. Just know you've got a shout out from Steve. If that means anything, you've got it. But the little summary on, on what we're going to cover today is a, a little bit about what FIG is. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on the business model, why we do things the, the, the way that we do. We've had webinars on that and many of you have spoken with us on that before, but just reply to the email that we sent you inviting you to the webinar if you want more details on, on what FIG is and how it works. But like I said, I will give a, a little bit of an introduction on that. We're going to talk about how you get equity from day one on our fourplexes. And that might be blasphemous in the investment world, but we're going to talk about it. And I think once I'm done covering it, you'll see what I mean by that. We're going to talk about a couple of the projects that we have underway right now, one in Cypress, Texas, one in Nampa, Idaho. Oh, if my mouse doesn't get away from me there, sorry about that. And uh, we're going to give some cool information that I've seen recently on uh, beating the tax man. These investments aren't just about the cash flow, the cap rate. There are other benefits that come from the investments and I actually have a real life case study of one of the fourplexes that we've completed recently for an investor in Spring, Texas to show you in addition to all the benefits that you get from owning a fourplex, here's an extra cherry on top. Because I know many of you, well, I think all of us, the biggest bill that we'll ever get in our entire lives is our, prop, is our uh, income taxes. So if there's a way that we can make cash flow and lower our income taxes, I, I say we do it. And I think you, you, know, you wouldn't be here if you didn't agree with me on that point. So just so you know, in the age of attorneys, a little bit of a disclaimer here that I'm going to read to you. FIG is not a company, but a marketing platform. All information needs to be verified by independent study on your part. Can't be guaranteed. We've made our best efforts to be accurate in the assessment of future rents, interest rates, vacancy, and other details, but you should verify that. Please consult with your tax advisor, attorney, and other relevant professionals where appropriate. So there you go. We got the lawyers out of the way, but uh, we, we like to cover that kind of stuff. Oh, my slide formatting got a little bit off. Sorry, that looks terrible. So I'm going to skip it. <laughs> we'll talk about what FIG is just briefly. So some of you that have spoken to us, this is a review, but others, others, you haven't heard this before. But essentially, investors know that a fourplex is kind of the holy grail of investment properties when it comes to renting for cash flow, because it gets the best side of multifamily ownership and single family ownership. Right, So in single family properties, you have one income stream and typically one stream of debt to service with that. And that's, you know, if, if you're vacant, you're 100% vacant. That's no fun. The plus side though of single family financing on properties is that you're typically able to get a true 30 year fixed rate mortgage. See on commercial properties like apartment buildings, you've got a whole bunch of streams of income to service that one stream of debt, right? So a couple tenants move out or you have some repairs you're not really crippled that month. You've still got a bunch of revenue coming in. But the problem is, is that the financing that is available on those type of products is usually due and payable within seven or 10 years through a balloon payment. So with a fourplex, the great thing is you have multiple streams of income to service one stream of debt and you have a true 30 year fixed rate amortized loan, which means if you make your payment every month, you're going to pay the property off. Nobody can call it due earlier. And I think it's for that reason, there are those two that I named that fourplexes with conventional rate financing are very recession resistant. 
right? You don't have to worry about refinancing or, or reselling when your balloon is up and coincidentally the economy is bad. And you also have multiple streams of rent coming in. So if the economy gets bad, the chances that all four of your tenants aren't paying you rent because they don't have jobs or whatever, those go down dramatically. FIG is designed to take advantage of that business model. We're designed to do it in managed communities with an HOA in place. You all know those fourplex communities that you've seen out there before that are run down. Nobody's taking care of them. Nobody's replacing their roof. The tenants are hanging up in the, in the windows, whatever they want for curtains. Nobody's taking care of it. And so FIG communities are in HOAs that, that we originally set up and control so that tenants have to behave themselves. Investors have to behave themselves, right? You can't park the car on the lawn. You have to upkeep your units and the HOA forces you to do that through the dues. They replace your roof. They take care of the exterior of the property. They mow the grass. They remove the snow. They maintain the pool and all the common areas and even the insurance on the property. So these communities, the idea is they look the same when they're built in 10 years because somebody is minding the store. So that's just a quick summary on what FIG is, is all about. And like I said, please contact us if you haven't had a chance to visit with us yet about the details of that and, and the, the particulars as to why we do things the way we do. Right here, right now, what we want to cover first is why there's equity in these properties from day one, right? So let's, let's go over the scenario of a normal fourplex purchase. And by normal, I mean you go hire a real estate agent to go find you a fourplex. You say, I want to buy a fourplex in, in Boise, Idaho, or Houston, Texas, or Salt Lake City, Utah, right? And that agent goes out and they look at the MLS, so they beat the bushes and they come up with whatever they can come up with. Now, if you've tried this, you're laughing right now because you know what they come back with is pretty underwhelming. They tend to be older properties. They tend to be really beat up and have a lot of deferred maintenance. And you just don't really know what you're getting there. But in any case, you're going to go, you're going to find a property like that. You're going to contract on it. So over on the left of your screen here, the, just a loose summary of the process. And I, I go over something so basic because it'll make sense in a minute, okay? But you'll contract on that and then you close and you have to renovate it. So you're going to have some cash out of pocket after you close. And you may choose to refinance out of some of that cash later. So it's not just about your 25% down payment if you're financing you're usually going to have more above and beyond that because chances are that fourplex isn't in pristine condition. And you're going to be buying that fourplex at a market cap rate. And, and I say that most people are underwhelmed by that because it's older. It needs, it needs a lot of work, right? But hey, I won't lie to you. There's some pros here, right? You can close now. As long as you get an accepted offer, you can close now or, or whenever your financing allows you. You don't have to wait a long period for development and, and construction from the ground up. So that's a good pro. Another good pro is it's very 1031 exchange friendly, right? You know what the value is now. You can close. It's ready. That whole 180-day timeline that you need in place for a 1031 exchange, it really isn't an obstacle in most cases when we buy a normal existing fourplex. And that could be a fig fourplex too, or it could be something else. Now, the, these are viewed as lower risk because usually they have tenants in place. Usually the costs associated with the fourplex are well established at that point, right? If there are HOAs and property taxes, there's always property taxes, but when those things are in place, they've stabilized, they've leveled out. We know what they are, right? When you go new construction, and I'll show you in a minute, you can guess pretty close, but you don't have an exact number just yet. The cons, like I said, it's probably old right? You don't necessarily know what you're getting with the existing management. Even if you're going to take it over and manage it yourself, you only have so much reliable data on the existing tenants, right? And you're going to be paying market price. So that might work for you if you're looking for something soon that's lower risk and that applies well to a 1031 exchange. But at that expense, you're going to be paying market price, right? Taking the risk out of an investment isn't free. It costs money. The market is very efficient at pricing risk into these purchase models. 
So let's talk about how you get equity from day one on a FIG purchase. Just a quick summary of the process with FIG, you're gonna select the lot within one of our projects and one of our developments, right? You'll do a purchase contract and your initial deposit. You're gonna have some time waiting after that. So many of you know that. And then you're gonna close and begin construction. And you get to that lease up portion when you're done. And as a result, you get forced appreciation. We'll talk about that, what that means. There are some cons to this though, right? Number one, you need construction financing. I abbreviated that, but the construction financing, you got to qualify for it. You're going to pay interest, right? There's some hoops to jump through when it comes to going through the FIG purchase model. During that interim period between when you reserve the unit and when it's actually done, the market can change. That's another con, right? So you got to be pretty sure about the local area you're going to, what's happening in the economy, what direction interest rates are headed, right? That's that's pretty good right now. We tend to think they're going to be going down or, or stable. Your money is going to be on the sidelines for a period of time, but that does come with a cherry on top that I'll talk about in a minute. The pros, you get that forced appreciation. And what I mean by forced appreciation, there's, there's two kinds. I'll bring the other one up here. You see forced appreciation and market appreciation. Market appreciation is what happens when uh, demand is kind of outstripping supply over time and prices rise because people are progressively willing to pay more for an asset. It even comes from just plain old inflation, right? Speaking to my mom a couple days ago about the property that I grew up in, she paid a little over $100,000 for it back in 1986. That uh, thing is worth 330, 340 all day long. And most of the time that that property appreciated in value, uh, the market here in Utah where I live, wasn't appreciating more aggressively than any other market. It was pretty vanilla, right? So by the pure reasoning that sticks and bricks cost more over time, you get market appreciation typically at least with the inflation rate and then oftentimes more. For example, the last uh, five to eight years have been great for appreciation. Now, forced appreciation is different than that. Forced appreciation is something that you make happen. The market doesn't make it happen you make it happen because you took a raw piece of dirt or an underperforming asset, you bought it, you built it, or you rehabbed it, you did something, and now it's producing income. And like I told you, risk or low risk isn't free, right? You took the risk and you brought that property up to its true market value and other investors who are less risk averse are willing to pay more for that because you took all that out of the equation. They don't want to have to deal with it. In addition, you get brand new construction, you get a warranty in place. Anytime you move tenants into a rental property, once they've been living in there flushing the toilet for a couple of months, you know what you really have on your hands. So it's nice if it's under a warranty during that period so you can get the bugs worked out, right? You get a clean slate on your lease up, right? You know what the standards are in tenant qualification from the beginning. You don't have to worry about inheriting a deadbeat tenant that you now have to evict and now you got a bunch of repairs in that unit. For some of you, this will apply and we're gonna talk about this later. You'll get year one bonus depreciation. With the new tax law that's in place, it's almost like the IRS wants you to buy fourplexes because you get a lot of bonus in taxes on that first year when you're the one that builds the new property. That's a big reason why a lot of our clients do this. And because you got that forced appreciation, right? You're in that property for less than what it's worth. Better cap rate equals better cash flow. So money, more money going into your pocket every month. So like I said, this has its risks. It certainly has its pros. Those that come and invest in the FIG model wrap their head around those pros and that's something that they want. And they ultimately decide that those pros, although the cons are very real and they're there, they outweigh those cons and that's why they come to us. So yeah, once again, sorry about some of this formatting here. I uh, worked on this on two different computers today. But uh, with all that being said, that's a little bit on the forced appreciation and why you can get into these investments with equity from day one. Let's talk a little bit about some of the markets that FIG is currently operating in and, and where we have projects uh, happening, okay? Some of you are familiar with Starwood Farms in Cypress, Texas. It's a 240 door project. The construction is gonna begin in September of 2019. There's amenities or good solid amenities here, a pool, 
little clubhouse area, walking trails, dog park, right? All those kinds of things. Some cool playgrounds too um, at this project. So it's going to be very amenitized, a good community with a 7% projected cap rate. And let's break that down a little bit more. And I'm not, I'm not getting into the weeds on this. You can contact myself or, or John Metcalf if you want to get into the pro forma and why we think all these numbers are the way that they are. We'd be happy to go through that with you. But you've got your projected cap rate. Your year one internal rate of return is about 24% with a cash on cash of 7%. Once this property stabilizes, you should, you should profit at around $1,000 a month with a little over $12,000 a year. That's just on your, on your cash flow, like I said. So I am going to scroll through my list here and I am going to unmute John. Let's see if he, uh, there he is. Okay, John is unmuted. This is a map of the area where Starwood Farms is. Hey John, can you, why don't you try saying something? Let's see if we've got you. Thanks to be aboard, Steve. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me fine. Yeah, yeah, I can. I can hear you, and I, I'm going to assume that means everybody else can. Will you tell everybody what we're looking at here and then get into some details as to why an investor should care about this part of Cypress, Texas for the long-term security of their investment? Excellent. Happy to do so. Um, so uh, this is the third development that FIG has done in Texas. Um, the first two were also in what we consider Northwest uh, Houston. Um, four data points that I would bring up that may be helpful when FIG first moved here to Texas. Uh, they look at areas with uh, population growth, job growth, low unemployment, and availability of land to develop. Um, in, in Texas, there's four large MSAs. There's the Houston area, which we're talking about, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Austin. Uh, both Houston and Dallas-Fort Worth have populations of just over 7 million people. Uh, down in the Houston MSA, uh, the population growth has been tremendous. Uh, every 10 years, they add about a million people. Uh, this year alone, they project 120,000 new residents. Uh, job growth is strong, 71,000 projected jobs in 2019. Uh, unemployment rates low, 3.9, and availability of land. So this this map that we're looking right now is of uh, Cypress, Texas, which is in Northwest Houston. In fact, all of those MSAs we just discussed go right through Northwest Houston. Uh, so I-10 would go to the west, and that'd take you to San Antonio. This is Highway 290, which is the main road to Austin. And then I-45 going north is the main road to Dallas. Uh, Highway 290 that you're looking at uh, right here goes right through Cyprus. And so you can see kind of to the north, uh, you've got retail, you've got hospitals, all of your kind of downtown Cyprus. And also below south of 290, you have neighborhoods and, and lots of development. This entire highway 290, 34 miles, has been in a seven year development process. They're expanding it. That's a $2.5 billion expansion, which is scheduled to be completed this year. Um, and this has resulted in absolutely tremendous amount of growth in the Cyprus area. Uh, investment, new neighborhoods, new retail, um, and the location that you can see right there, site, uh, that's where Starwood Farms um, is going to be located. Uh, this is actually a, an interesting piece of, of property. Uh, there's not a lot of property in the area to be developed. As, as you look at that uh, map uh, in Cyprus, there's not a lot of large tracks. Uh, this particular location was the former site of Quick Copy. Uh, it was their corporate headquarters. Uh, Quick Copy back in the 70s and 80s uh, was kind of like Kinko's. Uh, they had franchises all over the world. And this is where they brought all of their franchisees to be trained. It's about 50 acre uh, piece of property. Um, that uh, property has never been available for sale until the owner passed away a few years ago and his children have, have, have now sold this property to developers. There's actually two parts to the site. Uh, there's a northern part, uh, 24 acres, that's currently being developed as a mixed-use uh, retail, medical office, Class A apartments, and restaurants. 
It's under active uh, construction as we speak. Uh, buildings are going up, uh, the site's being developed. Starwood Farms is located on the lower uh, approximately 10 acres, and that's where they will, uh, we will find the 240 townhomes. Uh, we're, we're quite excited about this area and this project in particular. It, it has enough land that it allows us to put in, uh, as you mentioned, the neighborhood pool, parks, walking trails. Uh, there's going to be a leasing office, and it's going to be completed in six phases. Uh, we're currently in phase one, uh, it's sold out. It's uh, starting construction next week. Uh, phase two is the next one that will be starting in October. That's mostly sold out. I think we still have three buildings left there. And then the remaining phases will be constructed from November through uh, February. The site is located uh, just under a mile from Highway 290 going north on Kelgi and about a mile to uh, if you go to the west, is the downtown uh, area. Uh, I've been investing in this area for 15 years. I've got a portfolio of single family homes. I've purchased three fig uh, fourplexes and I'm also buying here in the uh, Starwood Farms. I've lived here for 24 years. All my kids have attended the schools. So we're quite excited about this, uh, this project here in Starwood Farms. That's a good overview, John. Thanks for that. And uh, just to let everybody know, this map, I didn't come up with this. We, we poached this from Capital Retail Properties. They're the, the developer that's going into the, the north of us here. And, you know, if you get asking around Houston and they find out, somebody finds out that you're developing next to Capital Retail, they go, oh, well, that's good. They're known to be a quality developer that can look out on the horizon and the path of progress and the growth uh, that's happening. John, I'll leave you um, unmuted for a second because I've got a couple of slides that uh, you may want to comment on as well. Let's move off of our map here. I figure you would all be interested in seeing this. This um, Marcus and Millichap, one of the big commercial real estate firms in the country, released a multifamily report. They do this every quarter on the largest uh, MSAs in the country. This is their third quarter report of 2019, so it's very, very current for the Houston Metro. I've kind of a screenshot of the report, the front page over it on the left, but there's a few things to highlight. They're, they're stating that the Houston Metro has grown substantially over the past cycle, adding new households at nearly triple the national pace since 2010. So people are moving to Houston and the ones that are already there are having babies, <laughs> right? That's, that's how we would sum that up. As the market expanded, demand increased for healthcare, education, and professional services, adding even more to job creation. We also see specifically Cyprus in our third excerpt here, where fewer units are supporting triple-digit vacancy declines across multiple sub-markets, such as in Baytown and in Cyprus slash Waller. Uh, John, Waller's just uh, about 10 minutes up the road from here on the 290, correct? That's it. 10 minutes past the Cypress going out towards Austin. Yeah. So even further. So the growth is pushing out that direction towards Austin. Yeah. Okay. So the, the final outlook is that faster population growth outside of Harris County bolsters rental demand in the Metro's outer suburbs, drawing both developer and investor interest. So we're not the only ones that, uh, that think this. In fact, oh, my formatting is awful. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so the, the Neighborhood Scout report, excuse the chicken scratch here, shows the makeup of the, the employment sectors here in the Telgi neighborhood, right? Uh, mostly education, scientific, manufacturing, healthcare, right? We see that. Over on your right side of the screen, we see ratings. And I'll send you all a copy of this report if you reply to the email because I realize my formatting is less than desirable here. But uh, Lambkin Elementary School, we're going through the, uh, the website, greatschools.org gets an 8 out of 10 rating. Uh, Arnold Middle School gets an 8 out of 10. And SciFair High gets a 10 out of 10 from uh, gradeschools.org. So this is, a, this is a high net worth area with excellent schools and excellent growth. We view it as an investment that uh, if you get, on, get into this thing and hang on, you'll be happy. You'll be a happy camper here. So, John, I'm going to mute you out unless you have something you want to add to that. I don't. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So we'll scroll through. We're going to talk a little bit. Uh, that, that's our summary on Cypress, Texas. We're going to get into Laguna Farms, which is in uh, Nampa, Idaho. Chase, I have found you. 
there you are. Chase, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, I've got you. Sorry, I got uh, fat fingers on the mouse here. Um, I'm going to run through, through some highlights on Laguna Farms up in Nampa, and then uh, we'll turn it over to you, okay? Great, sounds good. So Laguna Farms is 300 doors in total, construction in May of 2020, and this one split out over two phases. Um, we have almost all of the first phase reserved, but there will be a second phase, and there are a few stragglers in that, in that first one as well. And it has similar amenities to Starwood Farms. We're talking pool, clubhouse, walking trails, lots of places for tenants to move around and feel like they're in a good, master-planned, well-maintained community. All right. So on this particular project, you're looking at a projected cap in the high sixes with a year one IRR of 25.2. Your cash on cash is 5.7. You should net a thousand bucks a month and about 12 grand a year as well. So numbers wise, these two projects are actually quite similar to one another. Uh, Chase, I'm going to go to a basic map on the next screen. Why don't you kind of walk us through the Nampa area, what you see happening and why we like it. Okay. I think more than anything, before I dive into Napa specifically here, I want to just zoom out just a little bit, not on this screen here, but just uh, chat with everyone online here in regards to the Boise Metro, also known as Treasure Valley. We're looking at the southwest side of Idaho, consists of about 725 people. And the main reason why I want to zoom out just a little bit before we get into Napa is... I think you mean 725,000 people. Yeah, yeah, sorry, 725,000 people. It's a minor detail, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but we've seen a lot of articles recently where people are talking about and, and stating that it's one of the fastest growing cities, and a lot of times you just hear, hear Boise. But it's important to note that when people are talking about Boise or the Boise Metro, that also includes uh, Napa and Meridian. We're seeing extreme growth in both of those cities. And I know we're looking at Napa here, but if, we, if you had your, your maps in front of you, feel free to check in there. Off to the right there, you're gonna have Meridian. And then just right of that, you have Boise. And so within that location, it's, it's very nice if you go there, you can be at our project site there where that red little arrow is. And if you wanted to get to downtown Boise, we're talking about a, a 20 to 25 minute commute which is amazing. You can yeah, that's live, a breeze. Yeah. You can live in Napa, you can live in Meridian in those locations and, and get downtown and still enjoy some of those things that you want to enjoy, whether you're working there or, or whether you want to go out and, and enjoy the nightlife or, or go to Boise State and enjoy a game. Important things to note there in Napa, we're a little under 100,000 population. The growth here in Idaho is a little different and what John was talking about there in Houston, 2018, they had a little over 2,500 people moving to the Napa area. Meridian were a little over 6,000 people. And then in, in Boise, believe it or not, it was, it was under 2,000 people. And the reason why I point that out is what I've been talking about here is we're seeing more people that are starting to move to Napa and, and Meridian a little bit more than the Boise city because the cost of living is a little bit cheaper. So where are these people coming from? Well, within its state, the state itself, a lot of people are moving to Napa and Meridian from other places within Idaho. We see people within Utah County going there. California, there's been a huge rush of people from California, Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange County that are going there and then Maricopa, the Phoenix Metro, Arizona, people are moving there. That's, that's where we're seeing a lot of people coming from to that location there. Why are they coming? So what's driving people to that area and why do we love it? Why does FIG like that market so much and why do we have that site there? Great question. Cost of living, talked about that a little bit. Your price to get into a, a single family home, to get an investment property, your cost for rent is gonna be much cheaper than what they're seeing on the west side or the west coast. Crime rates are very low. Crime is almost non-existent. It's very safe to have your kids play in the neighborhood, go to the parks, 
people are very friendly within that area and, and people love that. I would also state that the state in general or that location is, is naturally beautiful. You're going to enjoy four different seasons where you can get outside, you can enjoy walking trails, biking, hiking, um, skiing, which is pretty amazing. Another thing that I'd point out is the job opportunities. You have your tech jobs there. Healthcare and hospitality is huge. You got some major medical centers right there in Napa. You're going to have St. Alphonsus and then also St. Luke, which is close by there in Meridian. And then you have the Union Pacific Railroad there in Napa that's going to bring in quite a, quite a bit of employment as well. The overall culture drives people there. You got jazz, you got theater, you have Shakespeare festivals, you have outdoor concerts, spring, summer, and fall. It's just a, a cute, quaint city that you can really enjoy, whether you're in Napa, Meridian, or Boise. There's plenty of things to do, especially downtown uh, Boise. You can, you can go to a game, like I said before. You can enjoy the, the atmosphere there. There's shopping malls nearby, dining areas, and then there's also numerous parks. As you can see, that area, as we're looking at that map, there's a lot of green space, not only open land and places to build, but there's parks that families can enjoy. There's golf courses, things like that. The last thing that I will also mention of why we're in that location and what's driving people there is the education opportunities. We're looking at a major university, Boise State, four-year colleges. There's, there's numerous four-year colleges there. There's at least four that I can think of. And then there's community colleges and trade schools there. And that Napa campus that you're looking at right there is right by one, College of Western Idaho, the Napa campus. And so those are some of the reasons why we've seen so much growth in that area last couple of years and why FIG is within that location. There's just a lot of pluses to that area right now. Yeah. When you look at the Boise Metro and if you compare it to say Houston, you know, it's got a 10th of the population, but um, for the Pacific Northwest, it's growing quite rapidly and it's easy to get around. People move there for a lifestyle experience. They want to reduce their cost of living, be in the great outdoors. It's, but, but simple to, you know, it, I think you, I'm not sure if you were there, Chase, but a couple trips ago, some of us here at FIG took, went up to Boise to work on some project details and our Uber driver was from Kauai and he was a, a surf bum from Kauai and he moved to Boise and, and absolutely loved it there. So people are coming from all over the place that want to simplify a little bit but also have a, a really good cost of living and, and such. So anyways, let's continue forward. Chase, I'm going to put you on mute for just a minute, unless you have something else you want to add. The last thing that I will leave with is we read an article recently, and we can send this to you if you'd like, that Treasure Valley Housing, they have a housing crisis. They're in need of 19,000 plus more homes by, by 2021. And it's what that means is the price for a home is going up and, and the price for rent is going up. So those yeah. are, that's, that was definitely a, a great article to look over. If you want us to get more specific as far as this location of Napa, as far as stats, let your FIG agent know and we can send you an overview that we've done of Napa. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Chase. Thank you. Um, I got a question on the chat. I'm going to go ahead and answer it because it's really simple. If, if I don't get into enough details, this question's from Lewis wants to know what parameters we're using for the loans when we're getting to our net cash flow. Um, just really simple, Lewis, we're talking 25% down on your construction loan. You're going to have an interest rate of around 5% when the building is done. So you'll refinance into a long-term 30 year fixed rate mortgage at around 5% um, on that on that loan. So that's what we calculated the, the mortgage off of. And we of course added taxes, insurance, all those carrying costs on top of it. So I hope that helps, but uh, reach out to us if you'd like to dig into some, uh, some more of the assumptions there. So a few more highlights on, on the Boise market. I got this from the Boise development group, 
couple highlights from a recent article they released. And this article is based off a similar study to the Marcus and Millichap study that I featured for Houston earlier, but this one's from Collier's. So you've got 95 to 99.5% of all units have people living in them in every area. The lowest is in Southeast Boise, that's 95 and a half. The highest is over in Eagle, which is closer to, to us. Boise saw the fifth highest increase in overall apartment rents in the country. And the rents are up year over year, 11.8%. I'm not gonna sit here and say you're gonna get that uh, this year, but that's, that's a sign of a market that needs rental units. It needs clean, new, affordable rental units. And it's a huge reason. Here we are to my terrible formatting again. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so embarrassed about this. I edited this on my laptop and I emailed it to my desktop. And I'm, I'm doing this webinar from my desktop. And uh, yeah, I look less than prepared here, I apologize. But your makeup of employment in this particular neighborhood in Nampa, and Chase alluded to this, two big hospitals there. We've got a lot of health care at 14%, and a bunch of retail comes with that to support those jobs. Everything else from there, you can see Union Pacific Railroad with manufacturing, and there's transportation and public service. You've got nine and six and six out of 10 on the schools, on the school scores for the area. So they're good, solid schools where people will, will want to live there. So... Those are both the markets that we're in right now. We keep getting lots of questions about fourplexes and depreciation and some of the ancillary benefits, all right? So we like to say that fourplexes are ideal. This isn't our, um, our lettering, right? This is a well-known concept that a lot of people that promote real estate use. But when we say ideal, in real estate, you get income, right? Many of you are here because of that. You want the income you want depreciation, you want equity, right? So as your tenant pays your, your mortgage for you, that creates equity, it pays down your principal balance. You get appreciation when the market moves, you get the benefit of that and you get leverage, right? Most of you don't buy stocks with leverage, but you can totally buy real estate with leverage and get all of the rest of these benefits with really only a quarter of the money of what the asset is really worth. So what people really like to talk about, oh, this is just, sorry about that. Um, I'll fix it here. When we talk about leverage, right? Something important to remember is that Fannie Mae gives conventional loans, right? So conventional loans are those 30 year fixed rate loans where you can put 20 to 25% down like I told you about before, okay? Well, you only get 10 of those in your name. So wouldn't it make sense to borrow as much flat rate money as you could with those loans, right? If I'm making any, any sense there. So that, uh, that leverage is how you can just hyper-focus on these type, of, these type of assets. And while I was doing that, I was kind of fixing my slide. So, you maximize those 10 conventional loans. If you were to go buy single family properties with these loans, you'd only be able to get 10 doors. If you get fourplexes, you get 40 doors, thus making yourself even more recession resistant, like I was talking about earlier. And if you subscribe to the fact that we have inflation, uh, that inflation is probably more than what the government is saying it is, they say it's somewhere in the mid to high twos. Uh, my groceries feel like they cost a lot more than the mid to high twos in inflation every year. I don't know about yours, but these loans are an excellent hedge against inflation, right? A, a guy I admire, Jason Hartman, has a term called inflation-induced debt destruction. When you borrow fixed rate money over time, like I said, your property appreciates, but because of inflation, the dollars that that debt is denominated in become increasingly worthless. It's fixed but your payments, your rents that you get go up. So it's an excellent hedge against inflation if you feel like with a lot of the money printing that we have in this country that, uh, that that's a problem. So now let's get a little bit into the, the last piece of information that we wanted to, to cover today that, that many of you have been asking about, which is depreciation and cost segregation. And first of all, I have to point out to you here that I'm not your accountant, okay? You need to ask your, your CPA about this because it's a very specific topic it depends on your income, a lot of other factors. So this is just very general education on the topic. So essentially, what with depreciation, 
it compares to like a normal write-off you would get in a business. For those of you that own your own business, if you go buy a laptop for your company, right, you can write off the cost of, of the laptop, which is great, you know, pay taxes on that money, but you did have to spend the money. Depreciation is awesome because it's a non-cash write-off. The IRS basically says that the sticks and the bricks, so not the dirt that your fourplex is on, but the sticks and the bricks can be depreciated over 27 and a half years. And that's great. In theory, you could take the value of the sticks and bricks, divide by 27 and a half, and know that you have that write-off on your taxes every year. However, most investors are capped, right? The most they could take is 25,000 in passive losses, right, per year. Now, what happens is, and the reason people get excited about cost segregation is because if you have enough properties and you're spending enough time, like the majority of your income is earned through real estate, you can become a real estate professional. And therefore, the cap of 25000 is lifted. Now, the, the income and the losses you make in real estate are active. So, in theory, you could have an unlimited amount of depreciation that you could take. This becomes especially powerful if you're a, a married couple. One, cu one person works, pays high W-2 taxes. The other person isn't, but they're managing the real estate portfolio. If you're married and filing jointly, the one who is not working claims real estate professional status. They have an unlimited cap on the depreciation they can take, and they can go t make a giant hit against the taxes that their spouse pays every year. It's an excellent formula. And if you're, if you're not married, and you have enough properties, you could, in theory, A, take this against active income, or if you're passive, you can actually take this, uh, a cost segregation study and apply it against your passive income and how that's taxed. All in all, I, I consulted with one of our CPAs we work with a lot here at FIG, John Harker. Um, according to John, this is worth it whether you're active or passive. This is going to add up. Let's see how it adds up. Because this is a screenshot from an actual cost segregation study on a fourplex in our project called Bridgestone Crossing in Spring, Texas. Okay. And this assumes a few things, right? This, it assumes that this uh, investor, I think they're in like a 40 or no, they're in like a 37% tax bracket. Their tax rate is 37%. Okay. So you actually might save more than this when you get the state involved as well. But essentially what happens with the new tax plan and what I had alluded to earlier is you get a bonus on depreciation on the first year when you construct a new property. And the whole essence of cost segregation is, is we want to break down that 27 and a half year period that the IRS gives you for depreciation. We want to make it less. So you hire a company like these, the cost segregation consultants, that's who did this one. And they break your building down into lumber and shingles and cabinets and flooring and fixtures and all these kinds of things, right? When, will, when was the last time your water heater lasted you 27 and a half years, right? That's the point here is there's a bunch of personal property within the, the fourplex that can be depreciated faster. So they're able to take that property that's reclassified over five and 15 year depreciation schedules and cram it all into year one. So if you're having a good year, you want to invest, you can see on our first or second line here, the year one tax savings that this particular investor got is $34,715. Meaning if he had a $100,000 tax bill, he just reduced that tax bill by $34,715. That takes all of these other dimensions of the investment, right? The income, the depreciation, the equity, the appreciation, and leverage all to a whole new level because you just put that extra amount of money in your pocket just in the first year. I mean, that doesn't even assume you got any rents coming in. So we've been getting asked about that increasingly. And once again, like I said, this depends on what tax bracket you're in. It depends on whether you're taking income as a passive or active investor, whether you're married, a lot of things. But this is a pretty vanilla situation from what we hear most investors come to us with. And I wanted to be able to share it with you because once again, on fig fourplexes, you get a decent amount of cash flow on a safe asset, a decent amount of appreciation. That appreciation is typically tied to the rents increasing over time, but you get huge tax benefits as well. And that's why we all eat our own cooking. Chase, John and I, all of us on the call, 
we all buy fig fourplexes for ourselves. We don't just sell them. This is something that we take the money that we make and we invest into these assets too. So um, I need to apologize profusely again for the formatting that didn't transfer over from Mac to Mac here, but you can see our, our uh, contact information. Uh, let's talk. If you feel like you want to get involved in one of these projects, like John said, we have some in Cyprus that start in early October and November. Those could work for 1031 exchanges, even though they're new construction. So those are coming right up. If you feel like you want to be into Idaho, I think the soonest we have is um, late spring, early summer next year, we have some available units in Idaho. So we're here. You've probably heard from one of us already, myself, John, Chase, or Sherida. So reach out to whoever's been communicating with you if you want to get into the specifics about how the FIG process works, the timing, available units. We can make great recommendations to you on the interior upgrades of your units and a few other things that will really make a difference over time in how much rent you get and how low your vacancy rate will be. So we hope that's been helpful as to dig in a little bit deeper into what's happening in Cyprus and in Nampa some of the positive tax consequences that can come with investing in a fourplex and also how you can get some forced appreciation from day one on these assets. Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate you joining us and we'll send out a copy of the recording on the webinar here within the next day or two. Reach out if you have any questions. Enjoy your day.